Hello, and welcome to Towards a New Zionist Discourse with Danielle Hartman, the president of the Shalom Hartman Institute, and Gil Proust, the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. Before we get started, a note that closed captioning is available for this program. You can view the captions by clicking show subtitle at the bottom of your screen. Today's session is part of Ideas for Today, the Shalom Hartman Institute's National Virtual Learning Program, and is also part of the Shalom Hartman Institute's partnership with the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. You can learn more about Ideas for Today in the link that we will put in the chat. My name is Jennifer Raskis, and I am the director of Washington, D.C. for the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America a premier center of Jewish thought and education. If you are with us here today, you appreciate the power of Jewish ideas. Aspirational Jewish ideas make us smarter. They compel us to take action. They are a force for good. The Shalom Harman Institute of North America and the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington are proud to partner to provide the greater Washington Jewish community with thought leadership on the most pressing issues pertaining to Jewish identity, Jewish values in American democracy, Jewish peoplehood, and Israel. We are thrilled for the second year in a row to offer our public programs on this national stage. A few logistical notes, this program is being recorded and will be shared with all registrants after the event. Gil and Danielle will be taking questions from participants towards the end of the session. If you have a question, please submit it at any time, utilizing the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for being here today as we join Gil and Danielle for a conversation about Danielle's recent article liberal Zionism and the troubled committed. It is my pleasure now to hand it over to Gil Proust and Danielle Hartman. Gil. Thank you so much, Jen. It is a pleasure to be here today um, and a pleasure to be working once again with the Shalom Hartman Institute. And I'd like to welcome the nearly 600 people who registered for this event. Um, I especially want to thank uh, the various communal leaders who joined us today as part of a broader effort to continue these conversations beyond the specific uh, webinars that we hold. What we hope to achieve during these sessions is to not only have an hour of discussion, but to really elicit a broader conversation within our own families, our own communities, um, both small and large. And so we thank you all for joining today. Today's conversation um, is a really important one facing um, global Jewry, um, Israel, American Jewish life, et cetera. Over the past four years, in partnership with the Shalom Hartman Institute, we have been working to identify and then bring to life those critical issues that face us as a Jewish community. And we do this not just for the sake of eliciting conversation or starting ideas, but we know the power of ideas. We know the ability to think differently, to use new language and to transform the way that we interact and think about the world in which we live. And so today, what we're doing is we're focusing on Israel and how we talk about Israel. In many ways, one of the most challenging questions that we're facing as an American Jewry or in fact, global Jewry uh, today. And so what we wanna do is really start a conversation around what does it mean to talk with each other, not just at each other? How do we broaden the conversation and bring in voices that perhaps may or may not be at the table? How do we understand the starting points for all of our points of engagement? And how do we build a more vibrant Jewish community passionate about our work in the United States and deeply connected to the Jewish homeland, the state of Israel? We're gonna be asking questions, who's in and who's out? What does that mean? How do we think about that? And how do we move forward together as a community? And so when I read this article, I knew immediately that this would be a critical point of conversation and that we needed to have this together as a community. 
And so again, I hope today is the beginning of what should be a very rich and ongoing discussion about American Judaism. Let me start off with a couple of stats before I welcome Danielle. Nice to see you again so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be in conversation again. But just a couple of statistics about American Judaism and its relationship to Israel. And we've seen these from national studies and local studies. I just want to put them out there. So nearly six in 10 US Jews say that they are very emotionally attached to Israel. Another 25% are somewhat emotionally attached to Israel. 82% of US Jews say that caring about Israel is essential to what it means to be Jewish and that that's important for them. At the same time though, we're also seeing larger and larger segments of the Jewish community who are trying to create a sense of Judaism without Israel. What does it mean to be an American Jew, but absent the role of Israel within that conversation? We see segments of the Jewish community um, who are struggling with Israel and what it is and whether it fits with their values um, as liberal or progressive American Jews in today's space. And so the question that we're facing and the challenge that we have is really not just about where we are today, but where are we going into the future? And so that really is going to be a central part of this whole conversation. So Danielle, I wanna start this conversation going back a little bit because at some point you said, I need to write this article. There's an issue that I'm thinking about that I'm struggling with. What led you to write the article, Liberal Zionism and the Troubles Committed? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, nice seeing you. Nice seeing you. <laughs> and, and nice being with everybody who I can't see. Um, it's a leap of faith that you could see me, so. The, there's two things that um, motivated me. The first, I would say the most important thing is a, the recognition of the gap that is being created between Israeli Jews and North American Jews. It was where increasingly Israelis are less troubled or they're not talking about being troubled. And see, as for me, there is no Judaism if the Jewish people aren't together. It's, it's game over. It's, it's just the wrong religion. And if Israel and world Jewry walk away from each other, it's not a problem for Israel. It's, not a, it's the end of Judaism for me. Because Judaism starts with the Jewish people. And... I wrote this article out of a recognition that it's not that North American Jews are uneducated or that North American Jews are, are, are uncommitted and they're getting something wrong and that, oops, if I could just give you a fact, everybody, all, everything would be fine. I wrote it because at a, at a, it, was, it was an I, I was this, I, I was forced to write. It's like it came out of me like this um, because I realized that there's a real problem going on and that we need to find a way, whether it's you in Washington or me in Israel, or it's, it's the Jewish people. We need to find a way to talk um, because there's a real problem that's not gonna be solved by a fact. And it's about validating the place of the troubled committed in North American Zionist discourse and rec and and realizing that it's, that it's only by validating that space will, will we give ourselves maybe a generation to resolve this ever-growing gap between an Israeli society, which is very Jewish and uses Jewish values on a whole range of issues. When it comes to the Palestinian conflict or non-Jews, doesn't bring any Jewish values to the conversation or very few besides pikuach nefesh of Jews, you know, saving the life of Jews. While for American Jews, you know, it's Zionism will only be possible if it's a, if it's a Jewish agenda. And if most Jews are liberal Jews, if it's a liberal Jewish agenda. And uh, so that gap 
is of great concern to me. And the article was written as an attempt to respond to that. So, so take us a little bit more into the article. Um, we uh, put the link up in the chat so if people want it, but you created this, this classification and this understanding of the troubled committed and the untroubled committed. And we can focus on those two in particular to start off. Um, how would you define more both who those are and what differentiates those two groups? See, there's the untroubled committed who are a very small group in the American Jewish community and other statistics, there are ones which speak about the fact 20, 25% believe that any criticism of Israel is, a, is an act of disloyalty, for example. Um, the untroubled committed are those who believe that there is no place for either, either there is no place for criticism for Israel because it's an act of disloyalty or don't feel any criticism towards Israel because Israel is is, is, is the embodiment of perfection or relative perfection. And they're, you know, occupy all of it. These things don't bother them. Israel is startup nation and, and LGBTQ plus heaven and, 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 and water out of air and, and a hospital in Syria. And, and, and we're still milking Haiti a little bit more there. It's just, you know, when they when you look at Israel, it's 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 rosy eyed, it's 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 utopia. And there's a very strong group of people who believe that. Or if they recognize it's not utopia, it's as close to utopia as you could possibly get, given the realities of trying to build a country in the Middle East. And as a result, there just is no, there's no cr criticism, just is not doesn't it's not part of their conversation. They're committed to Israel. And in fact, they're untroubled. And anytime somebody is troubled, they either see it as a fundamental factual error, there's something that they don't know, or they're anti-Semitic. And those are, the, so you're either ignorant or anti-Semitic if you're a critic of Israel. And Jews could also be anti-Semitic. And, 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 and it's a very deep feeling. Now this group, there's a number of characteristics of that group. Um, they are a higher percentage of those who vote Republican. That's one group of not everyone, but they are more predominantly. There is an overlap. They're more predominantly Orthodox. And there's also an age imbalance or an age um, identifier of that group. Usually, you know, six, six, 70 and above is where you'll, as you get lower and lower, you find smaller and fewer members in the. Um, in the troubled commit, in the untroubled committed camp. I'm committed to Israel unquestioned, un unconditionally, and, and just frankly not troubled. You know, they look at amnesty or look at whatever they look at, anti-Semitic, false, wrong, have, there's a whole slew. That's one group. The majority of Jews in America, and the statistic you were mentioning that there's another statistic, 60% want a two-state solution or plus, or for mm -hmm. a two-state, plus. Um, um, majority aren't comfortable with the current status quo. Troubled committed are those group, is that group of Jews who are committed to Israel, who, as you said, you know, the 60% who are very, or somewhat, you know, 80% troubled committed, of course I want a relationship with Israel, but they're finding it harder and harder. Or they're, or, they're tr the first stage is they're troubled about what Israel does without that troubledness impacting on their committedness. But it's a spectrum because there's hyper troubled who are holding on to their commitment, but don't know what to do, are feeling like it's, and you know where they feel it the most? With their kids and their grandchildren. Um, they're, they're, it's, they're, cause then they're seeing their kids and grandchildren slip into the domain of either, of, of principally the untroubled, uncommitted and checking out. It's only a very small group who become untroubled, um, who become troubled and uncommitted, you know, and, but it's, uh, so that, those are, it's like, I, I love Israel, but I'm sorry, what Israel's, there's things that Israel's doing wrong. And what do I, how do I talk, where's there a space? How do I talk about it? Not publicly, of course there's a space, but how is there, how, in the pro-Israel community, 
how, what place is there and validity is there for my, for my troubledness? And how does my troubledness express itself within the context of my Zionist commitment and not be seen as an act of disloyalty? So let's kind of um, talk a little bit about this, the, the two key words of uh, that, I mean, when you have kind of the discourse of liberal and Zionist. And I want to kind of, you talk about towards kind of a liberal Zionist and to, and to the two words that probably they're on this Zoom, there'll probably be on hundreds of different definitions perhaps that people hold of those two words. So as we're talking about it, when you say um, liberal Zionist discourse, what do you mean by liberal and what do you mean by Zionist? Because those two things are central to your answer of what we're trying to do. Okay, I just got off of a two hour, um, research team meeting exactly on this issue. You know, we have, for 15 years, I have this I engage team, 14 years now, um, which meets every single week for two to three hours with a team of people. And uh, so I'm really ready for this question. Okay. <laughs> people were, we were arguing with each other, um, but I'm, I'll tell you what, I, what I'm playing with. For me, liberal Zionism, is all about the category of justice. Justice and equality. Justice and equality for Jews and justice and equality for everybody who is either in the state of Israel or under the control of the state of Israel. Zionism starts with a belief that we Jews have a right to safety, security, and sovereignty just like other national groups do. It's really simple. It's a justice claim. It's not, oh, you know, I'm a Rahmanis, I'm a pathetic, you had, you know, Holocaust, you're killing me, please do me a favor. No, it wasn't, it's not, I'm not asking for justice. Zionism is founded on the principle of justice and we do Zionism a great disservice when we forget that we, as lovers of Israel, it's founded on my claim of justice. I deserve justice too. And you know, the IHRR definition when anti-Zionism becomes anti-Semitism, maybe we'll get to that, is when you have a double standard. Having double standards to Jews is anti-Semitism. I deserve justice. If America, France, Greece, I am a people. And as nation states were being formed, I wanted my sovereign space where I could live, where I could develop my culture, where I could fight, where I could um, where I could flourish, and I wanted to do so in my homeland. So Zionism starts with justice for my people, justice individually for Jews, and justice collectively for Jews. And the demand that I be treated equally like other nation, like other national and ethnic groups around the world. That's, that's my, the principle of Zionism. Liberal Zionism takes the same principle of Zionism and says, that is the first. And the, the survival of Israel is a just claim. But other than immediate issues of survival, as a liberal Zionist, my commitment to justice does not stop and end with the Jewish people. I am committed to justice and equality for Palestinians. I'm acquitted for justice and equality for all Jews, whether you're Orthodox or not. I'm, I'm committed to justice for the dif different um, ethnic Jewish groups, any, any and all um, discrimination is my enemy. Because as a Zionist, my commitment to justice is, a, it, it, my, my commitment to justice for Jews grows out of not, it doesn't grow out of my loyalty to Jews, it grows out of my commitment to justice. Now I have law, I want to apply it naturally. Everybody has, has, has prioritization to their community. But justice is a foundational principle of my, of my religious life, of what it means to be a Jew. I claim it for myself unapologetically and I demand it for all others unapologetically. Now, liberal Zionism is a complicated issue because how do I balance them? What happens if creating justice now for Palestinians will destroy the state of Israel? That's where you never, that's where you start a conversation. You never, in our universe, it's never a choice between good and evil. 
It's between how do I apply competing moral claims? And I live on the intersection between the right of the Jewish people to justice and the right of Israeli Arabs and Palestinians to justice. I live in the claim of each one of the inner tribes of Israel to their place and how do I build a just society? But for, that's what liberal justice means. Liberal Zionism, excuse me, means. And this is, this is not just a pedagogical move where let's, you know, let's use the category of justice because everybody else is saying, no, no, that's what it is. Let's, let's, and we do Israel, we do the Jewish people such a disservice when we allow Israel's enemies to claim the category and to own it, while we, you know, we're about survival and we're about history and shtuyot, narishkai. It's about, it's about tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. Jews have to pursue justice as the essential feature of our religious life. Liberal justice, liberal Zionism is about applying it to the Jews individually and collectively and applying it um, to all those who are living in the Jewish state or controlled by it. So I wanna, there's, there's a question in the chat that I wanna kind of pull out because I think it'll get at some of the, and clarify the distinction between the, the um, troubled committed and the untroubled committed. And it has to do with, um, don't we need counterparts, right? So if we wanna pursue peace and justice for the Palestinians, don't we need counterparts on the other, on the other side to actually achieve that and what if we have no partners, then what, what, what's, what's our role in that process? Your role is to pursue it without dying. Because that would be an injustice. Your job is to pursue it without creating a greater injustice to Jews. And so, so many people talk about, yes, the only just property, you know, like the one state justice people. Really, you show me one, you really believe that Jews and Palestinians in a multi-ethnic single state are gonna live at peace and coexistence with each other after a hundred year conflict? Really? You know, so I, I, you know, I'm a rabbi and this is being taped, so I'm only gonna use nice words, but really? But really, like, what have you been smoking? Or in fact, what basically happens is you're not really worried about Jewish survival. And then, so you know what? So you're gonna create now an injustice to 7 million Jews in Israel? So I'm there. Life, living a moral life is never simple. And part of our job is to pursue it. I wanna pursue justice for Palestinians as long as it doesn't undermine, not my security. I'm willing to endanger my security. And by the way, I could say that because I'm living here. I'm willing to take risks for my security but I'm not willing to commit suicide. So I'm willing to, I, I wanna look at, I wanna look at what the army's doing. I wanna look at why a unit is tying up an 80 year old man. And if that unit did it, and I wanna disband that unit. I wanna look at what we're doing. I wanna look at checkpoints. I wanna look at, 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 at processes of, of, of whether Palestinians living in the West Bank have access to judicial, um, uh, I forget the term, um, um, to, a, to a judicial system to deal with their, with, with their, with their, with their complaints. I, I want to talk about how I'm training. I, I, if, if I can't yet start a Palestinian state because I don't have a partner, that doesn't mean that justice is not relevant. So I don't have perfect justice. Welcome to this universe. You never do. It's never perfect. And it's never perfectly equal but I know how close I want to get and I know what I have to pursue. Would I want to live as a Palestinian today under Israeli occupation? The answer is no, I would not. I'd want more. And then we say, ah, well, what do you care about? In fact, the two, the best place besides uh, the Gulf for an Arab to live citizen is in the West Bank. Great, you're better than Egypt, you're better than Syria. Okay, that's nice. But I'm talking about as a Jew, my pursuit of justice. So it's not perfect, but I know I want to pursue it, but I'm not going to, that's why I used to be for a unilateral withdrawal from Judea and Samaria. After we tried it in 2005 in Gaza, I felt that the claim of justice demands of us to do something, but it doesn't demand of me to die because that's to create a greater injustice. So it's about balance, but I have to pursue it. 
and we're not pursuing it. And that's part of what I wrote in the article. Israelis, Jews are now saying, we, they, we don't have Palestinian peace partners. We haven't put forth a peace proposal since 2005. We haven't. The closest we came was a bar Ilan speech. Now, today, even meeting with Abu Mazen, Netanyahu used to say all the time, we were committed to peace. I will meet with anybody and any time, as long as it's, there's no preconditions. That was who we, of course, what Jews don't want to meet with, with, if no preconditions, you want a precondition, sorry, I'm not interested. You want to talk about peace, I'm there. Now, when Gantz meets with, uh, with Abu Mazen, not only is the right wing, what are you doing? You're deli- what are you meaning? He didn't, there was nothing. He was talking about Israel's self-interest and we're talking about the security controls because most terrorists are arrested by the Palestinian police. That's who, is it, we can, no, you can't even meet and the right wingers, oh, I wouldn't have done that at this time. We're, we're, we've, the fact that we don't have a peace partner doesn't mean that there's nothing that we could do. There's so much that we could do. There's so many things that we can improve now that has nothing to do with Israel's security concerns, nothing. And there's so much that we can do to try to foster the peace partner that we want. See, when you're committed to justice, you pursue it. And you don't say, well, you know, they're there. Okay, their being there requires of me to be really careful in my policies, but it doesn't define my core of the values that I aspire for and that I try to test and, 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 and live by. So um, I have one more question on this and then I'm gonna take it a little bit um, broader. But in the article, you state, and I'm just gonna, it's a brief quote. If the only place where the issues of the troubles are seriously considered is among the uncommitted camp, liberal Jews will not remain troubles, trouble committed. Correct. Can you expand, I mean, I mean, why do you think that that's the inevitable outcome of um, kind of the way that discourse is happening or not happening within the Jewish community. You picked up on, 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 on I think, one of the most important points in the article. Um, if you had asked me what questions to ask, I would have told you that. Um, but we did not. We didn't set this up. So I really appreciate it. You know, it goes back to why I speak about justice. I think we Jews have bought into the anti-Zionist um, attacks on us. We're letting them own the moral high ground. We believe it. Now it's true, I do believe that Israel is morally failing on a lot of fronts. But I don't believe Israel is a morally failed country. It's a very big difference. Human beings constantly morally fail, but we're not morally failed. Um, there's a lot of great things going on in Israel. But there's a lot of challenges and moral failures that we have to put on the table. But if, when the untroubled committed own the stage of pro-Israel, then what is a person who's troubled supposed to do? If my troubledness is either because I'm anti-Semitic or because there's some fact that I don't know. And I spend a lot of time, one of the big points of the article is to speak about this whole factual debate because it's very often what we throw at people is the wrong facts. We have a bunch of troubled people today and we say, oh, you shouldn't be troubled. Don't we know that in 1947, they turned down the peace treaty. They turned it down after 67, they turned it down in Oslo. Okay, that's fine. But all of those facts don't explain why Israel is still expanding settlements today. It doesn't explain why we're not doing everything we can to lower the footprint of the occupation today. It doesn't explain why we're not talking about moral rights for Palestinians today. There's a lot of things we can do today. And all these facts have nothing to do with it. But what they do is they shut them down. So then they're saying, okay, so if I'm in the committed camp, I have to, don't, I can't, I, there's no, I'm not a pro-Zionist. So then if the only place where a moral conversation is being put forth is among those who were troubled and therefore they've decided to become uncommitted because they say, I can't be committed to Israel and have a moral, and have a moral agenda. 
if, if, more, if morality is only talked about in, amongst the anti-Zionists and not at Federation, not amongst us who love Israel, because we're now hunkered down, we're fighting. You know, there's a war, they're calling us apartheid, they're doing this, they're doing BDS. We're fighting all the time now, we're defending Israel. And what we're doing is we're defending Israel with one group, but undermining Israel with another. The core group that of Israel's security is based on a strong Jewish community in love with Israel. It's not just dependent on whether states pass anti-BDS laws or not. It, that counts too. I'm not belittling that, but that's not the only front. It's another front. And we're leaving those Jews exposed because their moral concerns don't have a place. I'm being disloyal. And now it has, we have to lead with that. That has to be the essence. And woe unto us if we buy into the anti-Zionist notion that moral discourse has to lead to being uncommitted. All right. So um, well, one very brief question that came up in the chat. Um, do you see people as being uh, in fixed categories or are these are people moving across them? Great question too. A lot of the troubled committed are very fixed. The only shifts that are happening in the troubled committed is death. Um, you know, it's, it's a dwindling group of people, time, age. It's, it's, it's getting smaller and smaller. Um, there isn't a lot of movement from troubled committed um, to, to um, excuse me, from untroubled committed outside, unless you're talking a generational one. And we do see there's a lot of children who are brought up in trouble, untroubled committed educational systems who just don't believe what they're being taught. So there is a generational shift, not necessarily a shift amongst the people. I do see a very significant shift amongst the troubled committed. And that group are becoming hyper troubled right. and they're still committed, but they're holding on. Their level of commitment is not as thick. And today you have to remember the level of, when the level of commitment becomes less thick, it's not, the, it's just, they check out. See, I'm not worried about most Jews moving from troubled committed to troubled uncommitted. You know, the anti-Zionist, you know, the if not now kids or whoever they may be, or the, you know, the few Jews in JVP who are, you know, I'm, I'm untroubled, I'm, I'm troubled and therefore I'm uncommitted. I've walked away from Israel. Our biggest concern as Jews is people saying, you know, this is too, this is just doesn't, this doesn't touch, this is not morally, it's not where I want to be. And they just become um, uncommitted. You know, they, they either become, they become troubled, uncommitted, and then untroubled, uncommitted, because it's when you're uncommitted, you don't stay troubled for too long. Right. And I do see a lot of shift. You know, how important is this for me? You know, how important? This is, this is the question that so many of our children or grandchildren encounter when they go to campus and they're being attacked and, and where you can't be a liberal and a Zionist at the same time. You know, that, that you, you are not a welcome member in liberal American or progressive discourse if you're also a Zionist. And for many of them, it's just, you know, and I just, it's, it's, that's not what I'm in college for. I, I you know, I'm, I, I wanna have my, my experience, my, do I need to carry on this, this? I don't need it. And if it doesn't nurture them Jewishly, if Zionism doesn't inspire them, if they don't feel the justice of Zionism, why, you know, just let it go. So um, I want to raise a kind of two uh, competing, um, certain competing ideas that you that uh, you lay out, some of it in the paper, some of it in uh, things that you've spoken about since the publishing of the paper. So on the one hand, you're focusing on broadening the discourse, changing the discourse, particularly for certain segments within the Jewish community, bringing in some of that um, moral conversation um, into it. At the same time though, you're also defining limits. And um, in various, you know, whether it's, are, are there limits beyond which um, it's no longer a liberal Zionist discourse, but it's, it's, it challenges kind of that basic idea. 
Yes. And you've and so I would love for you to kind of talk a little bit about both kind of you know how you thought about what the limits might be and why those categories that kind of define people in a different way. See, first of all, the issue of, 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 of limits and boundaries is really important, but I'm not sure for whom. You know who it really is important for very often, Gil, when people want to check, you know, is Daniil somebody I trust? Because in the real world, as you know, what is federation? You're trying to reach everybody. You know, boundaries is a luxury you can't really afford. You know who you're, you're, you're out there, you're on the front line in every single place trying to save and this and that, you know, it's like, come on, like we're out there. Anybody on the front line, you know, right now in Jewish life, who are we excluding? Like, you know, really? That I wish we had that luxury. We don't have that. You don't look like it's, I, I'm like you, I'm out there. I'm, I'm like, I want to save the Jewish, I'm like oh, boundaries. So if people want to know, could you trust Daniil? If that's it, like is Daniil kosher? What's your limits? Well, my limit, as I said, is that Zionism starts with justice for the Jewish people. The position that I find morally unacceptable are those people who advocate for the immorality of Jewish nationalism while embracing Palestinian nationalism as a moral prerequisite. That's crap. This is like, really? Really? There's what it's only the only national the only ethnic nationalism that's illegitimate is Jewish ethnic nationalism. So then you want to call it religious? It's not religious. You, so you define Israel in terms that it's not. It's when you claim that we Jews don't have a right to the justice that Palestinians have, or that every other nation in the world has, that you lose me. That's my boundary. Now, if I have a claim to justice, now work. How do you do it? How do you balance the justice? You know, you're living on that intersection of justice for Jews and justice for anyone who's either a citizen or under the control of the state of Israel, that that is what Zionism has to define. Now play it out. If you wanna be a one statist, I don't know how you are, but okay, tell me how, what is your scenario? What's your realistic scenario? I don't have a, I don't wanna have a, a singular political um, uh, perspective. Uh, if you want to be a complete one statist, how does that achieve justice for Jews? I don't know. And not a constant internal strife and war, civil war. If you are someone who says that I want to have one Jewish state, but a 90% Palestinian state. Okay. I Listen, might not be my position, but I can understand it. A person who says a two state, I can't, but I wanna have radical autonomy in area A and B and area C, I will give every Palestinian living in area C full citizenship in the state of Israel, including a right to vote, including the citizens of the, 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 the residents of Jerusalem. So will that add another half a million Palestinians? So now instead of 7 million Jews and 2 million Arabs, it's two and a half million. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those numbers we can live with. And there is that those are demographics that I could live with. But in but in Gaza, area A and B, they have complete and total autonomy, a complete state, everything short of a military. Okay, I could see the moral position in that. But it's when you claim that there's going to be people in area C who you're not, or or this this crazy condition that we have. We, we claim Jerusalem as a part of Israel, but Israeli Arab, but, but Palestinian Arabs, Jerusalemites don't become citizens of, they, they become citizens of Israel without voting rights. Sorry, that doesn't work. That's just not working. So could there be a, a non two state liberal Zionist position? Absolutely. Then you could have two, uh, by the way, a, an immediate two state solution, which would endanger Israel is just as dangerous as, is just as problematic as the one thing. Could there be other solutions? Bring them on. You know, Balin is now talking confederation and can't everybody, these are things we're all talking about. No one knows how they're going to work, but they're but they're positive conversations. Because what they're saying is that the minute I'm a liberal Zionist, I don't accept the status quo as a permanent position. Now, as long as you are committed to the pursuit of justice, including the rights of Jews. 
you're in my conversation. I want to, I want to, now, and even if you don't, I want to convince you. So it doesn't matter. But that's, this is the group that I'm trying, that these are my significant, this is the group that I want to save. This is a group that, that's going to be the carriers of Jewish history in the next generation. So, so there, I mean, there may be a lot of um, listeners on the call who may say, conceptually, theoretically, I agree with you. But we live By in the real way, world. Gil, Gil, Dayenu, that's not bad. <laughs> that's true. It's a good starting point. That's more, yeah, than, the, more than as a rabbi, any rabbi in a congregation will. It's like why there's always a but is where it gets interesting. But if you conceptually and value wise are really great, I did my job today. I can, okay, so maybe I'm exaggerating. They're probably, um, but so the the people who conceptually agree with you, they may say also, but we're living in the real world, and in the real world, there are anti semites. There are people who are trying to destroy Israel. There are people who, you know, um, are only are looking for us, you know, as members of the Jewish community, as Zionists, to also challenge many core components of Israel and its policies. And it just strengthens those people who are trying to cause us harm. Great. So let's let's yeah. let's deal. Let's deal with this because this is a great, this is a very common and a significant concern and criticism. Let's put it on the table. So let's, first of all, do you think I'm not living in the real world? Where do you think I'm living? I have a gun. Do you have a gun? I have a gun. And anytime terrorism takes an uptick, I wear the gun. What do you think, where do you think I am? I think I'm smoking something and just praying for peace? Planting flowers? I almost died for Israel. My family members died for Israel. My children fought for Israel. My grandchildren will fight for Israel. What do you think I'm some Pollyannish little uh, nutcase? That justice becomes, that somehow the pursuit of justice is contradictory to living in the real world? How explicit could I be? But this is, I want you to understand, this is the problem we're facing. This is what is causing, I'm telling you, talking about the real world, you want to talk about dangers? The minute someone talks about justice, you believe they're exiting the real world, I want to tell you, you're right, right off right now, the next generation of Jews from the relationship with Israel. You want to talk about the real world? Well, that's the real world. The real world is, is that you people have become frightened of a moral conversation as if morality can't exist in the real world. Really? Really? Who said it can? Perfect morality can, but aspirational? How? I said over, I was, de I was explicit. I said lower the uh, stop settlement building. Um, lower the footprint of the occupation. Create avenues of judicial review um look at army units that are being up that are being discriminated do has anything this to do with walking out of and letting hamas take over i didn't say that but this is this is what's happening people i wish i could see you right now and shake you but i can't on zoom but i want to shake you you're giving up on justice you're giving up on the jewish people that's not us and that's not you in america that's not the way you live in America. And that's not the politics you stand for in America. So why are you doing this for us? Why are you hurting Israel? The real world requires that we aspire for justice within the real world. When you create an either or between the real world and justice? You think that you're weakening Israel? Oh, those enemies of Israel, they don't give a damn. They're, they're already, you're, they don't need you. It's your kids, your grandchildren. It's Jews who are looking to integrate Zionism into their liberal Judaism. That's our risk. We've just become this, you know, we're all fighting Hamas and terrorists, and we don't realize that it's our biggest danger. It's not Iran, and it's not Syria, and it's not Hezbollah. 
Our biggest danger is that within a decade, half of the Jewish people are going to walk away from Israel. And that's not a, a, uh, an outlandish um, uh, scenario. Because you know, the, you know the statistics that Gil did not quote? 33% of Jews under the age of 40 believe that Israel is an apartheid state. 32% believe that Israel is committing ethnic cleansing. 40% believe that Israel is, cheat, is teaching, is treating Palestinians the way Amer with the racist policies that America treats blacks. That's, those are, 33% believe that we're, really? And we're an apartheid state that we're not even remote. It's nothing to do. It's just a complete false category. But that's where we are. This is my front line. And you're worried about justice and you're telling me about the real world? Well, my friends, this is the real world. The real world is not some little Fakakta JDP person running around there and trying, or Ilan Omar or a few progressive trying to pass the legislation. Okay, we have to fight them too. We have to. The real world is that we're losing the next generation of Jews. And in my real world, I am not, I'm, I'm willing to endanger, but I'm not willing to compromise the survival of Israel for anything. But who said justice cannot be pursued with that level of care? Who said? And my real world also includes your children. And unless we wake up and stop juxtaposing justice with the real world, we're gonna be left with a real world in which justice will prevail in Jewish life, but it will be a Jewish life completely disconnected from Israel. So um, one of the questions that was raised or- And I'm sorry if I got very emotional. It's like, I can't tell you, Gil, it's like, we're setting ourselves up. It's like, we're really? Yeah. If justice is dangerous, since when is the pursuit of justice dangerous for the Jews? You're like, if well, we've gotten I mean, to that place, you're, you know, you're, I hear you and I know, but like we've, we've, we're, we've become so worried about part of these. It's true, but there's so, we have, could be so much more nuanced, but that's what we're doing. We're shutting it down. We're frightened. Our Hillel, do you know how many Hillels across? I work with Hillels all across America. One of the best organizations in Jewish life. Really, you know, all of us, you know, phenomenal organization. Taking care of our, do you know how many Hillel directors are being shouted at? Don't talk about this on camp. Don't talk at your Hillel about this. Teach them, don't do this, protect, protect. Really? And the more they do that, the kids don't show up. It's, anyway, I get very, I get upset about this. So I, mean, I, I, think, I think it's important. I mean, obviously, I mean, um, you're addressing a different question than I think a lot of people who are entering the conversation. For a lot of people, and which is really about what is the responsibility of American Jews to Israel and to, uh, and, I, and I'm going to ask you this as well, um, you know, what should that look like? What's our responsibility? What's our role in ensuring um, a safe Israel? And you're asking a question of what is the impact of how we approach the conversation, how we engage with Israel on our own identity and on the future of our- And that community. that's about safe Israel. That's about safe Israel. That's, by the way, the same thing we talk to Israelis about, who are so, you know, Israeli politicians who are so ready to make Israel a partisan issue and, and build our career on evangelicals and forget about liberal Jews. And we say, well, excuse me, that's, that the safety of Israel requires Israel to be a bipartisan issue. Right. Same thing. It goes to the same, this is safe too. You know, it's, uh, anyway, yeah. So, so, I mean, the question I had is, I mean, when you think about this and kind of building on that is, so what do you see is the responsibility of American Jews to Israel and Israel to American Jews? Great, okay. So the responsibility of American Jews to Israel, first of all, the first responsibility that we have as American Jews is to make sure that Zionism is an integral part of our Jewish identity. You don't start with loyalty. You know, there's a very famous saying in our tradition that the Jew, there's a myth in our tradition that the Jewish people said, Na'asev Do you know that category of people? 
that now seven ishmada, when God said, I have a bunch of Torah, I have a bunch of laws to give you, in this mythic statement, we said, we keep, we'll, we'll, we'll keep everything, now tell us what. Didn't happen. No Jews ever did that. You don't do that. No one says, God, tell me whatever you want. I agree. Amen. Now tell me what. No. You don't say, Nasevedishma. You don't start with a leap of loyalty. You don't. You start with meaning. And for many of us, we had meaning. But we're unwilling to recognize that for many Jews, that meaning is missing right now. So our first responsibility is, 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 is to Zionism as a Jewish agenda. And how do we talk about that? After you do that, now, how do we, and this is again, and, and it's not an order of importance because we have a capacity to do all of them. We have to defend Israel's right to be against any, anybody who undermines our existence. Not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, but there is a lot of anti-Semitic criticism against Israel. And we have to fight all such anti-Semitic criticism. And I think, again, the IHRR definition of when, the IHR doesn't say that all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic, but there are certain key issues, type of anti-Semitic tropes anti, with entering into anti-Zionism. Read it, read it, it's not such a long document. What is it? It speaks about double standards to Israel. It speaks about speaking about Israel in Nazi terms. There are certain, key, certain types. Of, we have to fight all these spurious things. The amnesty report is just a sham. You read it, it just, it reeks. It reeks of anti-Semitic tropes, the way it speaks about Israel versus Palestinians, it literally, it is a racist document itself. We have to fight those. But at the same time, we have to do huge outreach to Jews in America. And the next feature is we, liberal Zionists of America, have to be advocates for liberal Zionism in Israel. And that means working to develop and to expand the scope of trouble committed in Israel. And you can say, oh, how do I write to do that? Every, your federation, every federation in America is trying to push for and strengthen liberal Judaism in Israel. You have to push and strengthen liberal Zionism in Israel. And that's not by coercing and it's not, by, it's by education. It's not by taking out an ad in a newspaper condemning Israel, and it's not about supporting the right of BDS or deciding whether you want to not fund the Iron Dome. That, that's not it. You, you care enough about Israel that you want to build the Israel you want. Okay, so get to work. Get to work. You have access. You fund institutions. You fund educational initiatives. Fund all those institutions. Tom Friedman said this 30 years ago. He had this phenomenal line. He said, Fund those institutions that are helping to build the Israel that your grandchildren would want to have a relationship with. Get working. Build, not coercing, build educational initiatives in Israel that aren't just allowing a reformer or conservative rabbi to have a wedding. You have no problem doing that. Liberal Zionism, that's as a Jewish value. Israelis are all PTS right now. So liberal Zionism has taken a hit. And Netanyahu really put it as the enemy and said, get rid of it. I don't want to talk about justice. I don't want to talk about morality. All I want to do is talk about survival. And in doing so, I believe he has harmed Zionism tremendously. Okay, it was his right. He had his, you know, it's democracy. I want to fight that. So help fight that. So what are your responsibilities? First, A, let me, let me enumerate the four. Be as clear as I can. A, make sure that Zionism is alive in liberal Zionist camp. Articulate a vision of liberal Zionism, of Zionism that a liberal Jew could adopt. A, two, I don't know, it's at this hour after, make, make sure I remember all four. <laughs> <laughs> the second is defend Israel from its enemies. And its enemies aren't its critics. Its enemies are the anti-Semites who, 
who believe that we, we don't have a right to justice. That's the second. The third is promulgate liberal Zionism through educational initiatives to strengthen it in North America. And the fourth is to build liberal Zionism in Israel. That is the responsibility of North American Jews who are the troubled committee. Thank you. And that actually answers one of the questions that, that was also raised about some specific things. Um, there's another area that has been raised. So my guess is without knowing the specific demographics of the people who are watching, um, is that most of the people are probably abo above the age of, I'll be generous, 40. 45, 40. Um, and, but people want to be able to have the conversation either with their children or other people under the age of 40 who may be approaching these issues in a different way. Um, how would you um, encourage someone, particularly if they, you know, whether they are a troubled Zionist or an untroubled Zionist, how would you encourage them to have the conversation? Um, and, you know, maybe around something like the Amnesty International Report, which is kind of hot off the, the press or other things. How do they sit down and talk to them and create that space? Um, so if I could be so arrogant for the first thing will be um, get the recording of this and listen to it again and take note. Because I'm modeling for you something. Speak about Zionism in terms of morality and recognize that the moral aspirations of Israel is not about anointing Israel as the moral superior nation of the universe, but it's about applying those categories, including critiquing Israel and finding out, okay, how do you pursue justice for Jews and justice for Palestinians and for anybody under Israeli control? That's the story and embrace it and then say, yes, I agree with you. So that's one thing. On the amnesty report, here, it, it gets really hard because there are things that could be said um, that you have to make sure you see. Here, I wanna, you have to be very careful not to say that which won't be heard. And Yossi and Klein Alevi and Ilana and I just spoke about this at depth in our, my, in a podcast that should be coming out today, actually, our latest, um, came out your time just a few hours ago. Um, there's so many things that you say that just shuts people off. So when you come and you say, oh, amnesty. Oh, it's, 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 um, it's anti-Semitic. When you use that language, you lose your kids because then they believe you're using anti-Semitism as a, as a, as a knee-jerk defense to silence criticism. Or when you say, Oh, they forgot the context. Context, balance, complexity. And those are all code words, which you just, you're lost. You're just irrelevant. A colleague at the Hartman Institute just wrote an article in the Times of Israel called, his name is Jeff Farber, not Jeff Farber. I'll, I'll, let me just give me a second. I'll tell you who it is. I'm just blanking for a second. You know, when you're 63, this happens to you. Um, Happens when you're younger too. Thank you. Thank you for being so sweet and nice, but it's <laughs> happens to me a lot now. Um, but just give me a second. Zev Farber, excuse me. Colleague of mine, Jeff Farber. Zev, Zev, Zev Farber. Farber. Zev Farber. See, and that, that, that happens in 63. <laughs> <laughs> um, Zev Farber wrote a really, he wrote this article in the Times of Israel in the blog. It's called um, Apartheid is Not the Question. And he there's some, Give that article to your kids to read. He did a real good job. Because um, what he was able to do very succinctly was also to pull apart the core amnesty thing without, because so often, you know, the amnesty report is 250 pages. It's like, who, you know, you're not, how do you do it succinctly? And I highly recommend you look at that 
um, if somebody could even send everybody the article, I think it was a real contribution to the conversation. Um, but what you have to ask is when your children are asking a question, and they're asking a question, you have to ask what their question is and answer what you think their question is, not necessarily the question they're articulating. Because very often today, the word apartheid is not meant as a literal definition. It's meant to say this is a, they're morally failing. And so, you, but what the problem with the term apartheid is that it shuts down. When you use the term apartheid, you lose your legitimacy. So how do we create the space for a moral conversation about Israel without losing Israel's legitimacy? And to speak about, and you know, every country in the world has to be able to be morally flawed without somebody claiming it is no longer legitimate. Now, apartheid is the one place, you know, not, where you don't cross up. You know, America could be morally flawed. Hungary could be morally, I'm not saying that these are my models of, but the, the, the association of, 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 of moral shortcomings with legitimacy, that's what you have to break. And, but you don't break that by undermining the moral criticism or by shutting it down. I hope this, this conversation, Zev Farber, and staying away from some of those code words, um, listening carefully to what your kids are saying. And by the way, if they're still talking to you about this, that's a great sign. Because when they're the untroubled, uncommitted, they're talking to you about the wizards. Um, they're not talking, even though that's not such an interesting thing to talk about right now. Um, they're talking to you about something else. If they're talking about this, you're still in the, you're, you're, you're right in the conversation. You're, you're there. Don't worry. They're still playing. They're reaching out. So um, we have a couple of questions um, going back Is to- it politically incorrect for me to say something not nice about the Wizards? About the Wizards? What's your basketball team? Yes. The Washington Wizards. Yeah. So it wasn't politically incorrect. Like no one's going to say that was sacrilegious. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of questions about going back to the uh, meaning of Zionism and how do we effectively reclaim it? Um, and um, yeah, it didn't used to have such um, uh, for a lot of people. So sort of kind of potential negative implications when you said you're you're a Zionist. I mean, I think today for certain groups. But so I guess the two parts, one is um, the, the one question was, doesn't Zionism, is, isn't it more than um, justice, but about some, uh, a love of the Jewish people, a deep connection, something larger? Sure. Um, and how do we reclaim kind of ownership and the intent of, of the meaning of Zionism, right? As opposed to having it seen as something um, negative or, um, you know, kind of where the, I guess the kind of where the UN was taking it, you know, many years ago, uh, but seen as something about love of your people, um, as opposed to kind of how others have Wait, been. It's a great, through. great question. And, and it's, it's a very nuanced question because it recognizes that we actually, that in our lives, you know, as hate argues, we have complex values and complex motivations right? and loyalty and concern. It's not just about, you know, higher moral justice, universal category. Um, my assessment right now, and this is the challenge that we face, is that as Jews by choice, every Jew today has to choose to whether they opt in or not. We increasingly don't have people for whom opting in is self-evident. We just don't. And that's one of the generational changes. And just like people, you know, I remember, do you remember, you know, I remember friends and, and oh, where you move into a community, you, obviously you become a member of a shul, you become a member of the JCC, you give to the Federation. And usually if there's another shul that's not doing so well, you have more than one membership. And if it's not your denomination, even better because you're never sure which one God really loves better. So you're hedging your bets. And so a Jew belonged and they had membership and it was like a given. Could you today, Gil, self-federation as where's your love? You can't, you have to earn it. Right. And it's tough 
I know it's tough. Now you're right. I love Israel, period. You can't start that place right now. It's not gonna, that's, you know, you can gather a group around it, but it's not, it's just, not, even those who love it aren't gonna stay lovers, just like you're not gonna stay a member of a shul. You're not. And you're not gonna stay in, 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 the, in the donor list to federation. You're not, just because you were. It needs to be earned. And when I'm speaking about justice, I'm not saying that that exhausts your relationship to Israel. I'm saying that that's by re-engaging with it, it's going to enable the love to reconnect and to re-emerge again. It's a, it's, it's a necessary, it's not sufficient. And that's why your comment is very right. It's not sufficient. It has to be about love and concern and loyalty and a sense of belonging. It has to. You know, for those of you who've been listening to me for a few years, it has to be about Genesis Judaism. I'm all, I'm all there. But right now, you don't start with that love. You can't, because today, those terms are being questioned um, because of the potential moral consequences of it. And it's only when you could show that particularism is not mere morally inferior, that it has a space in a moral discourse. And I don't think it needs to be. Um, particularism is not a problem. And if Jewish particularism is the only particularism that's not allowed, that's an anti-Semitic statement, as I've said over and again. So it's about, it's, it's about justice, which then activates a much more complex life of culture and identity and loyalty. But now if you don't, if, you're not gonna stay there. The, the, in many ways, the attack, the, the liberal discourse makes particularism unacceptable if there is an insidious moral consequence to it. And we have to ensure that there doesn't have that consequence. Um, there were a By couple the way, in, my research, in the research group that we just had, uh, my colleague, Michal Biton, just challenged me, my theory, which I would, what I was just saying with the exact same criticism. But since she's not here, I feel like my answer was, was much better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. <laughs> um, so one of the questions and a couple of questions about um, Israel and more kind of the role of the Harpin Institute within Israeli society. Um, as kind of the different, you know, uh, subpopulations of Israeli society change and grow, um, larger segments perhaps of the Haredim or others, um, do you see, what do you see as a prospect for within Israeli society of liberal Zionism? Okay, um, great, again, great question. Um, Haredim are 10% are of Israeli society. And what we've learned from them and given the coalition governments in Israel, you don't need, there's never going to be a 50% majority. If you have 20 to 25% who care about something, you can shape the whole country. That means every government that's formed needs you. I don't want to, I don't need to convince the unconvincible. I need 20 to 30, I need 20%. Give me 20% who care about this, who are going to make liberal Zionism, if it's not the first, the second thing they're going to vote for. And if that happens, we're in business. Right now, unfortunately, we have only a, almost nobody puts it forward. Even the center left parties such as Blue and White, Yeshatid, don't put it forward. Even uh, Gidon Saar, who's on the right. By the way, liberal Zionism, the greatest liberal Zionists in Israel were Jabotinsky, Menachem Begin. These were the liberal Zionists. These were the liberal Zionists. It wasn't labor. Labor were never liberal Zionists. <laughs> was, these, were, these were real liberal Zionists. These were they cared, these principles of justice. Rivlin, Benny Begin. It's not a right-wing, left-wing position. Gidon Saar, when he separated from the Likud, should have been pushing for a liberal Zionist right-wing position. He could have, but it's just, so he really believes in it, but he's hiding it because it's like, so everybody's hiding this moral conversation. I want to bring it out. We need it. We need it, and that's going to be a basis for a coalition also with, with 
with five percent with the with the Arab Israeli population who are five percent. The Mahmouda. There's we have coalition. So we're going to take over the country, but I don't need to win everybody. Right. I just need twenty five percent. So and that uh, is achievable, by the way. Um, and I recognize we only have a couple more minutes, and I'm actually told that we have no more time for questions. But I'm going to ask one more. Um, and there's not a lot of time, but with all this, um, you clearly you remain an optimist. What what gives you hope around Israel and the American Jewish community right now? What 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 gives you that energy and the hope as we go forward? We have some. We have we have what to do. We we our job is not. What gives me hope? Our responsibility. Really, it's like. What do you mean? I, it's like pessimism. That's a luxury I never. I can't afford. Hope. We have work to do. I'm. Th- I don't. I don't. I don't have hope, and therefore I work. The responsibility creates hope. We have work to do. We've created a remarkable country which is safe, and secure, and prosperous in levels that we could have never imagined. Why should we stop dreaming now? Like now, let's get to work. And on that note, I completely agree. Thank you so much, as always. Thank you. It is such an honor to be in conversation with you and to hear your thoughts. Um, it is always a, a, a challenge of what we need to do next and where we need to go. And I completely agree. It is really kind of, it, we know what's ahead of us. And there's so much to do. And that's what's going to kind of get us to where we need to be. So thank you for your leadership and your partnership. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this conversation as much as I did and took as much away from it. I can tell you I will be watching it again um, to really and take notes and to make sense of it. Um, And I know that as a greater Washington Jewish community, we will take learnings from this and really think through how do we build a stronger more engaged, more connected, more committed um, Jewish community um, as we go forward. Um, I'm now gonna turn it back to Jen to close out uh, the presentation in this afternoon. But again, as always, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gil. And thank you so much, Danielle, for this incredibly important conversation. And thank you all for joining today. Please look out for an email from us that will include an educational toolkit that we designed to give you further resources and also to help you facilitate further conversations on this topic. Be sure to check out the full complement of offerings from Ideas for Today from the Shalom Hartman Institute. We are dropping a link in the chat. Be in the know about the latest ideas from Hartman by subscribing to our email list and by listening to our podcast, Identity Crisis, and for heaven's sake, and reading our journal sources. Finally, a huge thank you to our partners at the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. We are putting a final link in the chat for you to be able to learn more about this partnership and to view recordings of previous public programs that we have done together. Thank you all and have a great day.